Good evening. When I look around at the congregation here, it is encouraging to see people who have modeled and devoted lives around verses like Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. People with minds set on things above. You have been a great encouragement and example to me uh, through the time that I have been here with you. You have encouraged my family and have modeled what people who love and desire God and want to grow in God look like. And for that, I'm thankful. But this year, we are setting aside time to, have, to, to bring this idea of growing or igniting or, or moving from where we are today to where we hope to be tomorrow, to take a next step and see how we might progress in our relationship with God. And so as I said this morning, we're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight because people with a mindset on things above can also become a people who get distracted as the weight of life weighs in on them. We can get discouraged. We can even get disconnected from the place that we desire to call home, heaven. And so with our minds set on igniting, I thought it might be a good time for us to consider renewing our service and our dedication to God as we consider some examples of how we might do that and how others have served God and given Him their best in the past. Now, before we get into the lesson, I want to talk just for a moment about the picture on the board here, because you might be of the, the mindset looking at this and looking at this gentleman that's got his tie and his suit and his jacket and he's all put together, and you might be of the mindset to say, that's right. Giving God your best means dressing your best and looking like you are dressed for the nines. Well, if that's your thoughts, this sermon is for you. But maybe you're here today and say, that's right, that's not what giving your God your best. Your God is, giving God your best is not what you physically put on your body, it's spiritual, it's something else. And if that's what you think, then tonight this sermon's for you. I hope to be able to look at several aspects of what it means to give God our best and know at the beginning of this lesson that I might step on some toes tonight. I've stepped on my own in the course of this. And I have asked for prayers from others for this very lesson. I hope they, they took me up on that and prayed for it because I've been quite concerned with how we might bring these things about. But I do believe if we will think honestly and just, just consider to ask ourselves the questions that we're going to be looking at through the course of this lesson, that we might find there is always room in my life that I can take that next step and I can grow and I can seek to give God a little bit better and what I've been giving him in the past. And that's all that I hope to accomplish the course of our time here this evening. So let's begin by looking at some examples of the people who were first called God's people. Let's go back to the Old Testament and consider how the Israelites were told to give God your best. And consider how we might desire to do that ourselves. So we had Leviticus 22 read for us. Luke did a fantastic job reading that section where God is instructing them, when you are giving and making an offering to me, I expect, I desire that to be perfect. It is to be the very best that you have. It is to come, whether it be of a, of a lamb or a, a goat or of a bull, it is to be the, the best of that, the first of that, the, the healthiest of that, that without any blemish or any mark that is wrong. It is very focused. And we probably noticed that even some of the language that makes us a little bit uncomfortable, it is very focused on physically, this is the best you have to offer. That language is also employed in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12, verse 5, we're, we're learning about the Passover in, the, in that passage. And whenever they were to keep the Passover, they were to take this lamb, it was to be the first, it was to be the best, it was to be without blemish. Because that's what God desired. God was simply not interested in anything less than the best they had to offer. And that hasn't changed. We serve the same God today. An unchanging God who still wants our best. And there's no doubt in my mind then that that does pertain to our physical best. We talked this morning about singing. And that when we sing to God, we want to sing with the best that we have. Our prayers. We're going to pray to God and we're going to offer up the, the prayers of, of supplication, asking Him to, to help us and to support us in some way. We're going to pray with thanksgiving and with praise and we're going to do that to the best of our ability. <coughs> Or even our Bible classes. 
our Bible classes? Do we prepare for those? Do, uh, as, as the teachers of those classes, do we put time in to make sure that these classes are the best, that we, we can glorify God with what we're trying to teach? And as students, do we come prepared for that and seeking to grow and learn to the best of our ability? I want to take in what is being brought to me about our God. God is asking for our best. And so whether we be talking about that or what we wear, the things that we clothe our body in, this building that we have been blessed with, we are to be stewarding this building to the very best of our ability. There are many ways that we need to see that physically God deserves the very best that we can offer Him. One way that I think about often in our family, I'm going to come get my bottle of water because I'm losing my voice. But one thing I think about often in our family that I don't think I thought about enough growing up, certainly not enough as I was a young man in college and high school, and is not so much am I giving God my best through what I put on my body? Am I giving God the best of my mind when I come to worship? Or do I stay up till one, two, three in the morning? Watching TV, playing games, hanging out with my friends, going to events, and then show up on Sunday morning tired and just say, God, I'm here. You get what you get. I made it. Are we giving God the physical best that we can give him? Because that's what he desires. But what we see in the Old Testament that depicts that is a shadow of what the New Testament goes on to flesh out more. (laughs) It's not just about what we, what we put on, on, on this offering that we give. We can dress it up and make it ornamental and make it beautiful. We might put on the very best clothes and we might drive here with a full night of rest and we have thought about and we have prepared for, our, for the Bible class and when we get here, we're going to open our Bibles up and we're going to follow every verse. We're going to sing with the best that we can sing. But we offer up to God a life that is devoid of any change. Devoid of any transformation. In fact, that's the language that we see in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12, when when God talks about what he's looking for, Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present, to offer your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. We show up here with this decorated, ornamental offering of our our lives. It looks like it has everything right. And yet, in the back of our minds, we judge the people who don't look like us. This person showed up in jeans and a t-shirt. They must not think about God the way that I do. That person doesn't sing as as loud and as heartfelt as I sing. They must not be in it the way that I'm in it. Or do we leave here? Do we leave here after we've come and we've we've shown, we've just shown God how much we we love him and how much we're devoted to this by by taking their time to, to be here, but also taking time to prepare for this even the night before, and we've looked our best and we go out into the world. Maybe we go to lunch and our service at lunch is subpar people that are, that are serving us are messing everything up. We're not getting our orders, and we begin to grumble and complain and, and mistreat the people that are, that are serving us in these ways. That's not, that's not a transformation. That's, a, that's, conf, that's conforming to the world around us. That's the, what, we, what we transformed out of. That is sickness. That is death. That is darkness. And God is saying, I, by, my, by the mercies of of God, by the gospel, I have brought you out of that. And what I'm seeking for you to give back in return is the best of your life. The best of everything that you are. And yes, that's going to mean, I think about before I come to services, what I'm about to do. I'm about to come and worship my God. I'm about to come and set and sing praises to the God of heaven who have made me and has saved me and redeemed me. And I want to prepare myself physically for that, but I'm preparing myself spiritually for that as well. And He is our God, and He deserves the best of my heart and my compassion and my care. And so is my life reflective of that, of giving God my best. 
giving God what he deserves? Am I giving to God graciously? And am I giving to him out of abundance? I want you to put yourself, we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 28 for just a moment. I'm sorry, 26. Deuteronomy 26, I want you to put yourself not necessarily in the shoes of the people that are hearing this, because what we're about to read is happening before the Israelites cross the Jordan River, before they go into the promised land. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the people who are living these, this passage, what we're about to read. Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 through 15. The people that are living this and are experiencing this. This is looking ahead. This is preparing for this moment. Then it shall be, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, and you possess it and live in it, that you shall take some of, the first, some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you bring in from your land that the Lord your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare this day to the Lord my God that I have entered the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. But there he became a great and mighty and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, and God, the God of our fathers. And the Lord heard our voice, saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. And he has brought us to this place. And given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now behold, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it before the Lord your God, and worship before the Lord your God. And you and the Levite and the alien who is among you shall rejoice in all the good which the Lord your God has given you and your household. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, to the widow, that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. You shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion from my house and also have given it to the Levite and the alien and the orphan and the widow according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of the Lord my God, and I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel, and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, as you swore to your fathers. In those first three verses, I want you to think about a people who are thinking and looking forward to and preparing to be in the promised land. They're not there yet. They haven't made it. They're looking ahead and they're going, this is what it's going to be like when we get there. We're going to give thanks. And the very first crop that we grow, we're going to give it to God. And that's significant because I don't know if there's going to be a second. I haven't spent time in the land. I haven't gone and cultivated it and know that the soil is right for a second. I don't know what's going to happen, but the very first crop, it goes to God. In verses 4 through 8 and 9 through 11, we see that giving back to God was so much more than just, here, look what I've brought you. But it was a recalling that God has done so many wonderful things for me. God has brought me to this place, this ground on which I stand that is filled with blessing. That is filled with, with security. You have delivered me, God. And so I give back to you with a spirit that reflects on what you have done. And in verse 12, the man that we see in this, in, that is described in this, looks at God and all that he has provided him and recognizes this isn't just for me. But it is for my brethren. It is for the foreigner. It is for the helpless the despaired, and what you see are a people that are showing extreme gratitude and graciously and abundantly giving for all out of their desire to worship God, to give Him the best, was to give not only to Him, 
but something that would bless all around them. In fact, that's why God is blessing his people and bringing them to this place so that he can bless the world. So that he can bless the foreigner and the sojourner and the alien and the helpless and the fatherless. He is bringing them to this place so that they can bless them. He is bringing them to that place so that eventually he can bring his son into this world to bring the ultimate blessing of all. God is doing this to go abundantly beyond what we can comprehend. And he's asking us, when you get in there, you model that. That should be the characteristics and the attitude that we have as we come to worship the Lord. Whether it be in big things or in small ways, what God has asked us to do is to deliver our best remembering who He is. He is our deliverer. And you know what? Just like we see in that passage, that takes planning. That takes consideration. It takes a desire to do so. It takes a commitment to make it happen. And it should be the same with our worship services, that we prepare ourselves before service. We prepare ourselves for what we're about to do. You might notice uh, as we go through those opening slides, we have a few slides that ask us, that invite us to do that, to take a moment to prepare yourselves as we get ready to enter before the, the throne of God to bring praise to Him, to worship the God who has brought life to the dead who has brought life to us, who has changed and molded and transformed us into the image of His Son. But we also begin that planning before we get here. Instead of just jumping out of bed and rushing here to, 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 to come and try to make sure that we're in attendance. And I want, to, I want to say right now, I want to say right now that I'm not talking about this, just we, we occasionally run late, or we have circumstances that are beyond our control. Because sometimes we, we live in a life that is just beyond our control. I'm not talking about what time we get here or how often we run late. I'm talking about being prepared, being people who, like the, the Israelites in Deuteronomy, were saying, We're looking forward. We're looking forward to what we're going to do when we worship God, being the same sort of people that do that. Because in those moments when life just falls off the tracks, we wake up and the kids can't find anything, I mean the clothes that we've told them to set out the night before, when everything is just going haywire and we're just, there's no way on earth we're going to make it on time today. Am I prepared to still give God my best even in that moment? To not let Satan take over in that moment and just, we finally make it and we're late and everybody looks like they're ready to kill each other, but we're here. Am I prepared? Because circumstances happen. Me and Holly were driving through Berea one day. We're on, on our way to, to an event. Actually, I think we were on our way home from, from this event. We're on, driving through Berea. We come around the corner, massive traffic jam. It's just like, what has got everything so blocked up? And we're waiting, and people are trying to turn around and go back the other way, and we finally make our way around the next curve, and there is a house in the middle of the road. I thought there's no way on earth if I was late for something and I had to tell them why that they would ever believe me. <laughs> to be fair, it was a mobile home, but it was setting right there in the middle of the road. Circumstances happen. These things happen in the world that we live in. But are we preparing ourselves to say, no matter what the circumstance, today I belong to God and I am going to offer him up the best that I have graciously Offer him up the best that I have, and I want to do so abundantly as well. We should also remember that giving God our best and giving to him graciously and abundantly also relates to the relationship that we have with one another. We saw that in Deuteronomy. It wasn't just about how you gave back to God. It was about how you cared for others as well with what he had blessed you. Now, we might take passages like Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and we quote it like we're going to win an award someday for knowing it so well. Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. It's interesting, we usually only quote the first half of it, too. We kind of forget that there's a part B to that verse, encouraging and pressing one another on. In fact, verse 24 tells us that's the purpose of Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 24 says it's because we are devoted to giving God our best. Yes, by coming together and pressing one another on to give our best. Pressing one another on to love better. Pressing one another on to do more good works. To give the best that we have to God throughout our lives. That's the focus 
when we come together. But is it? We come together to worship? Do we come together in order to stir up one another? It is fair to say that we're not giving graciously and abundantly when we choose just to come to services when it's convenient. You know, it's, a, it's convenient for me today. I feel like it today. I think I will come and I will worship God. We're not giving graciously and abundantly. But be clear. We're here every single time the doors are open, but we come with no intention to ever lift up our brethren. No intention to ever connect with them in a way to say, hey, I know what you're going through. I know what life is like. I know that there's a way that you can continue to do what is good and pleasing, that you can be transformed and you can show the world around you, your family, your coworkers, your friends, what is the good and perfect will of God. I know that's a way that can happen. I want to help you with that. If we're not here to press on one another, to stir up one another... We shouldn't fool ourselves in thinking that I've come to give abundantly and graciously to God when I will neglect the people of his family. In fact, 1 John chapter 4, if you want to turn over there with me for a moment. 1 John chapter 4, I don't even think I have this one in my, on my slide. But in 1 John chapter 4, we see God's attitude towards those who will say, yeah, I'll give everything to you, God, because I love you but not have a concern for, the, for, our, for our, our spiritual family. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, it says, No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. The, the converse of that statement then, if we love one another, God abides, God resides, God lives within us. If we love one another, the converse of that would be true as well then. But if we don't love one another, God isn't making a habitation in our home. God isn't abiding with us. It's a correlation to our loving others to making a home that is fit for God to reside in it. Think back to, first, to, uh, to Ezekiel. God left the temple because the temple wasn't his home anymore. It wasn't a place where he was welcome. It wasn't a place that was devoted to him. If love doesn't reside in our hearts, God doesn't reside there either. But verse 20 goes on to make that perfectly clear what God thinks about this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's not more, much, much more on the nose than that. God says, this is the way I view those who say, I love you. I'm here to offer up to you, God, but I have no concern no care. I hate the people, the brethren around me. Even just one, my brother. God says, that love is a lie. That is not the best that you have to offer me. That is not even founded in truth. We want to give graciously and abundantly to God. We need to consider what He has done for us. We need to consider what he's done for the people around us and show that through our love for him and for his children. Then we also need to understand, and another great example that we see in the Old Testament is that when, we giving our, when we're giving our best to God, we're giving personally to him. That is to say, it costs us something. There is an investment involved. In 2 Samuel, we see a man that any one of us would love to have as a friend. We see a man who comes and, and speaks to David and says, David, I have an all-inclusive, already packaged sacrifice. It won't cost you a dime. It's all ready for you. David says, I don't think that's very valuable to give to God. If you look at that with me in verse eight, uh, chapter 24, 2 Samuel 24, starting in verse 18, it says, Gad came to David that day and said to him, go, and er go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunia, the Jebusite, David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. Aruna looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over towards him. And Aruna went out and bowed his face to the ground before the king. Aruna said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be held back from the people. And Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take and offer what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Aruna gives to the king. He said to the king, may the lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Aruna, no, I will surely buy it from you for a price. 
For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David offered there an altar to the Lord an offering of, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. David's mentality in that moment said, I've got to pay for this. This has to be, to be of any value. To be the best that I can offer to God, it has to cost me something. Is that a mentality that we find in our lives? Do we look for someone else to, to pre- package everything and provide it to us, having done everything for us? You see this sometimes when people say, I came to service and I got nothing out of it. The songs just didn't do it for me. The sermon, they didn't do it for me. They weren't, weren't doing anything that really, that really moved me or made me feel good. Are we looking for someone to do the work of worship for us? Because work, the notion that worship is about how we are moved, that's what makes it feel good. That is not a, uh, that's not a scriptural, that's not an idea that we see supported in the Bible. In fact, I wonder how many times the worship of God, while uplifting, felt like it was the weakest and it was insignificant. I wonder how in dark times, when people came and gathered themselves around the temple that was being rebuilt, that paled in comparison to the, to the first temple of Solomon, And the elders weeped when they saw this, but yet they worshiped God because we're here. God has brought us back. God has been faithful to his word. We're going to praise him. Does our worship cost us something? Because the worship we offer to God is supposed to require a personal investment of our effort of our sacrifice. And yes, we might say, well, it certainly cost me time. I, have, I set aside time every week for God. And man, as I drive past the gas station, and I know my drive is not as long as some of yours, but every time I drive past it, I realize it's costing me money. It's going up more and more every day, the price of gas. Certainly, certainly it costs us something, but other ways are we willing to pay for our worship? Well, we pay for our worship with patience. Patience when a brother stands up here and leads us in some way that doesn't, doesn't quite live up to our standard or our expectation of what we thought it was going to be. Whether it be a song leader or the guy that is leading the, the Lord's Supper or giving a prayer. When, when we, we, we hear that and we just go, you know what, that, that wasn't, wasn't what I expected. What, it wasn't what I wanted in my worship this morning. Will we pay the price of patience and courage? And recognize that I'm going to still give God the very best that I have, even if the leader didn't, the leader didn't lead that in a way that I thought was the best. Or what about the world around us? Will we treat them with grace and compassion, even if it costs us eating a meal at a restaurant with terrible service and terrible food? Will we speak with love to them or to our neighbors, even after they have treated us rudely? I remember that when we were in Nicholasville, we had a neighbor beside us whose brother had, had been away for some time, and he came to town, needed a place to stay, and he started living with them. And it was quite a shock for us, because every night, he went out in the backyard, and he built a great big fire, and they sat around with him and his buddies, and they drank beer, and played guitar, and had a good time, and we, we, we tolerated that. It went on every single night, but then Saturday night came, and I'm laying in bed as these people are outside of my window just 15 feet away. My children's window is right there close, and we can hear everything, everything that came out of their mouth, and not all of it was, was pleasing to hear. It grated against me, and finally I said, I can't take this anymore, and I went out and I gave them something. I gave them a piece of my mind. I said, listen, man, I don't know what you're doing tomorrow. I'm going to church. I'm going to worship my God. I need to rest. I need to be prepared for that. And as I turned to walk away, I knew I cannot leave this conversation. I need to apologize right now. 
says, I met a selfless and careless world with selflessness, or excuse me, I met a, met a selfish and careless world with selfish and careless words and actions. I didn't offer up to God in that moment grace and compassion and patience and love for the people around me. I wasn't giving God my best. And it wasn't because I didn't have enough sleep. It wasn't because I wasn't wearing clothes that were, that were sufficient for the moment. It was because I wasn't reflecting Christ in my heart. To serve God with our best, it's supposed to cost us something. And it requires graciousness and abundance. It requires our firsts, be that of our time, of our stuff, it requires our best. And the reason for that is because anything less, anything less than that is to dishonor God. Have you ever been running late for a movie? This is like one of Holly's least favorite things. Going to a movie, we will be there 30 minutes early because I want to get, I want to get my popcorn and I want to get a good seat. So we do not run late for movies very often. But maybe you've run late for the movie before, and you're, you're getting in there, and you're going, it's okay, I'm trying to justify this. I'm still going to spend this money because the only thing I'm going to miss are the trailers. I'm just going to miss the previews. And what we're saying when we say that is, these things aren't that valuable. There's no value in the, trailer, in the, pre the preview or the trailer compared to the actual movie that I'm coming here to see. I don't value these things as much, and so it's okay. Do we do the same thing with our worship service? It's just a Wednesday evening Bible study. It's just a gospel singing. Maybe it's just the first couple of songs that we're missing. We're just going to miss the first prayer. It'll be okay. We say things like that. What does it mean about the way that we value the time that we have that God has blessed us with? How about this? For parents, let me, let me preface this by saying I have experienced this three times and with a great level of trepidation will prepare to experience it a fourth time in, in, in just a few months. But I remember when the boys were growing up, when they were very little, at Winchester, the Winchester Church of Christ, or at the East End Church of Christ, when they would get, when they were unconsolable, and they would begin to fuss, and we would have to pick them up and take them out, calm them down. Or when they got a little bit older, and it wasn't that they were inconsolable or fussy, they were just, they were just forgetting and not understanding what we were doing and why we were here and why other people around us were here. And so we had to pick them up and take them out. And I remember walking, because we sat at the front of the building, and every time... Oh, we're about halfway up the building, and every time I thought, why am I sitting this far forward? Because every service, I'm picking this kid up, and he's crying, and I'm carrying him out, just looking at my toes on the way out. <laughs> but what if we say, you know what, they're just kids. They're just kids, and we'll let them be disruptive. Or far worse than that, there was a family that said, here is a phone. Be quiet. And as that kid got older, I remember when he was in high school, and I walked past him one day, and he's sitting in the back of services, and it's not a phone anymore. It's, it's a, a video game device. And I went to the restroom, and he's in the restroom playing video games. And he's not interested in why we're here. And he's completely disconnected from anything related to the service and the worship of God. Do we value? Do we value the blessings that God has put us in, placed before us to come together and to worship Him? The way that we think about all sorts of different things. I remember, and I, I may have shared this story before, and if I did, I apologize, but I remember being at a, a service in Zoe, in the, the hills of Kentucky, up in Batyville. I was at the Zoe Church of Christ, and Holly had taken Madden out, because Madden was, was very little, and he was crying, and he was hungry, and she took him out, and I'm preaching, and there is Easton, and there is Ryder, and they're sitting right here in the front, like you all are. They're sitting right there, and they are poking each other, and they are laughing, and they are giggling. And I stopped, 
And I just stared. And when they finally looked up at me, I said, you're both getting spankings after service. (laughs) And they did. I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that you have to do what I've done to give God your best. Please don't hear that. What I'm saying is each and every one of us, no matter our station and position in life, would do well to ask ourselves as a parent or as an elder or an elder's wife, as a preacher's wife, whether we are single or we are married, no matter where we are, even if we're not a member of this congregation, but we're here and we're here to worship our God, asking ourselves, am I honoring him with the best that I have right now? With my heart towards our worship together, do I honor God with the best? But I also want us to consider that that needs to extend beyond our time here together worshiping Him. Ask ourselves that when the person who's serving us at the restaurant meets us far below the expectations that we have for a waiter, are we going to just say, well, you know what? It was just a complaint. It was just some grumbling and some bad attitudes. But you know, it was based in truth. They messed everything up. They were terrible. They didn't even care. But does that complaint and the way that we think about that person who God created who God gave His Son to die for, who God is desperately trying to say, I want to win you away from the hands of Satan so that you can be saved, so that you can be restored? Does that complaint and that grumbling about them in that moment honor God with our best? All of these examples, what we're saying is this isn't as valuable to me as fill in the blank. Bible class, a gospel meeting, that thing isn't as valuable to me as fill in the blank. Undistracted worship. Not, I don't want to step on toes. Let me tell you, I don't want to. But I'm stepping on my own here. But I say, if we let our kids stay out all night long, if we let our kids stay out late on a Saturday night and they, they show up to services and they can't keep their eyes open and they're, they're dog tired and they're fussy and they're, they're having a hard time just paying attention to what the gospel message is trying to bring out in their lives that God loves you and God wants you. Are we saying that that's more valuable? That event, that whatever it is that we got them involved in the night before? Again, please, I'm not saying think like me. I'm not saying behave like me or parent like me. And if that's what you take away from this lesson, I have failed. Because that's not what I desire for you to take away from this. Please hear me when I say what I want us each to do is ask ourselves, what can I do to offer God my best? Because He deserves it. He deserves the very best that I can give Him. and Anything less is to just say, God, you get what you get. So we used to tell our children, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Here's the broccoli. <laughs> God, you get what you get. Malachi chapter 1 speaks to that. Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, that was happening. People were saying, God, this is, this is what you get. We're not going to bring you our best. To make it worse, it seems like the rest of the world was seeing that. The rest of the world saw the attitude they had. And God said, would your kings, would they accept an offering like this? Would your governor, would he accept an offering like this? You bring it, you wouldn't bring it to them, but you'll bring it to your God? The rest of the world still watches. Our families watch us. Our children watch us. Our co-workers watch us. They watch us. And what do we, our lives say to them about the value we've placed on the God that we serve? Ask yourself, am I giving my best to God? Because He is worthy of my best. Because He has given me His best. His only begotten Son who came and gave His life so that we could have life. What are we going to do with that? If not, give it back to him in the best way that we possibly can. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, look, I've tried to give my best, but I know what my best is. It's not very good. 
Because I haven't modeled grace. And I haven't modeled compassion. I haven't been patient with the world around me. I haven't given enough value to God and to his word. And I, I want to give God my best, but my best is pretty bad. If you're sitting here today thinking that. You need to know that God has offered his best because he knew your best wasn't going to do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, died and was raised from the dead? Do you believe that He offers you life with the Father, free from your sins, free from the pain and the sorrow and the consequences of living in a fallen world that has devoted itself to rebellion against God? He says you can find freedom from all of that in Christ. If you believe that, then believe this. When God looks at you, what he sees is his best, his Christ. That shouldn't motivate us to say it doesn't matter what I do. That should motivate us to say because God has done so much, because when he looks at me, he sees the the great price that he paid to have the best covering me, I want to give my very best back. If we can assist you this afternoon in doing that, it would be our greatest desire to do so. We would love to talk about that together, and if that is on your heart tonight, let's do that right now. Come forward as we sing this song of encouragement.